Hello. You have asked for it. Todd Conklin. Todd Conklin. Todd Conklin. Todd Conklin. Todd Conklin. The interview with Todd Conklin from the Pre-Accident Investigation Podcast. On July 24th, be one of the first to hear the Todd Conklin interview here on Safety FM. SafetyFM.com with Jay Allen. Changing safety cultures one broadcast and one podcast at a time. Welcome to Safety FM, where we talk about safety that's truly inspired by you. Hello and welcome to Safety FM. This is Jay Allen. This episode of the broadcast and the podcast is brought to you by Safety Focus Moment. They are consultants wanting to help you obtain the safety culture that you've been looking for. For more information, go to safetyfocusmoment.com. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different than what we're accustomed to. Today, we're going to talk about human trafficking, a subject that's normally not covered inside of most safety podcasts or safety meetings. But this is some information that I think that we need to listen to, not just as a person, not just as family members, not just as employees or team members, but this is something that we need to understand how it's having effect on us and affecting the world that we live in. So today I have an interview with with Susan Peters, Executive Director for OnBound. SafetyFM.com Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to the show. I appreciate you actually taking the time today to actually come on to Safety FM. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, Ms. Susan Peters, if you don't mind, if you could actually tell our audience exactly about your organization, Upbound. Okay. Um, Well, my name is Susan Peters and I'm the National Director of Unbound and we are headquartered in Waco, Texas, but we have chapters around the nation and also internationally and we are an organization that fights human trafficking. So a lot of people aren't aware that there are 40 million modern day slaves in the world today and so most of that is through uh, labor trafficking or through sex trafficking. So we majorly focus on um, sex trafficking and mostly domestic sex trafficking. And that means American boys and girls and young women that are trafficked right here in the U.S. in our cities. And do you see this being a common problem in the United States itself? I know that sometimes when we have these conversations or even think about it, we normally think about foreign countries where they would have the problem. So it's common here in the States. Yes. In fact, when we started Unbound in 2012, I thought we would do do more international human trafficking because it is such a global issue. Um, But when we started doing research about how much domestic minor sex trafficking and sex trafficking is happening right in our communities and we knew that we had to start here. And so, for example, right here in Waco, Texas, which is, you know, kind of a middle range city, you know, we had over 50 victims of human trafficking that we helped last year. And this year we've already surpassed 50. And so it's a huge issue. Unfortunately, it's a supply and demand business and there's a huge demand for bought sex and the seemingly in supply of young people that are vulnerable in our communities. And so sex trafficking has become a huge issue within the United States. And what do you feel are the lures that people are actually when they get into sex trafficking? How do you feel that they're lured into this? Well, most people think, you know, they might have seen the movie Taken. And so they think that these victims are kidnapped and forced into that. And although that does happen, that is very, very, very rare. What normally happens is a trafficker or a pimp can be a single person, you know, just have one girl work for them, or they can have, you know, it could be a drug dealer on the street that's turned to human trafficking and has three or four or five girls, or it can be a sophisticated cartel like gangs, drug cartels, business people, because this is a very, very lucrative business. I mean, one girl could make a trafficker $100,000 a year. So it's a very lucrative business, very low startup cost. 
and what they do is target young people. Usually the average age a young person is pulled in to sex trafficking in the U.S. is 15. And so that's a 14 or 15 year old that, you know, a lot of times it can happen to anyone. We've had college graduates. We've had um, last summer we had two girls that both their parents were CEOs of companies. Um, so it can happen to anyone, any nationality, ethnicity, socioeconomic background. But the majority of the victims are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, single family homes where there's not the protection in the home. Um, they have a lot of free time and they have vulnerabilities of wanting to feel loved or provided for. And so a trafficker will target those vulnerabilities in some, a young person get in a relationship with them, either posing as a boyfriend or as an older protector, and then slowly introduce drugs, sexualized behavior, and then start selling them. And that's how they become trafficked. And so that's, that's normally what we see as someone who is coerced into this life. And I have to say, you really said a lot. And so I want to go back and try to unpack a little bit of it. Now, in doing some of the research in regards to when we're going to have the conversation with you, we did notice that it said that the annual estimate is roughly about $150 billion in this particular industry, which is just amazing to hear, just hearing that number out loud. And when you start taking, taking a look and you're helping out people, what do you find to be the common, I guess, the, I guess the, the common audience or the common people that are actually going out there and looking for these, I guess, the people that are being victimized by this? So, so you're asking about what is the commonality of a trafficker? What does a trafficker profile look like? Correct. So, so how do I, so I know that you referenced that, you know, that they, that they pretend to be an older person or they try to attempt to be a protector, but who are the people that are, so now all of a sudden we have the victim that's being trafficked. And so how does it go about from the person that's actually coming and I guess asking for these sex favors or paying for these sex favors? Yeah. I mean, the victims that we help and um, their stories, you know, are very, but there's a lot of similarities. Um, Traffickers will very often target young people on social media. And so there are so many apps and Facebook messaging, Kick. Um, and so they will usually, you know, we had a victim that was 16. They, you know, it got posted on her Facebook pages. She was 16. And so the trafficker sent her a private message, happy birthday, and then built a relationship around that, posed as a 20 year old guy who, you know, over two months, just got this girl to fall in love with him and then when he showed up at her house he was a 40 year old um, and so and he was like well I didn't want to tell you how old I was because you're so mature for your age I just really wanted you to be my girlfriend and that's how he lured away and ended up pimping her out um, and so it's you know a lot of times it's targeting them through relationship building through social media that very often happens and a lot of times that young person will be you know, they're, they do risky behavior. They'll go meet them. They'll sneak out at night. You know, they'll, they'll, you know, maybe send sexting. They'll send an inappropriate picture. But then that trafficker uses that information to blackmail them or, you know, pull them in deeper and deeper into this trouble that they had no idea they were going to get into. Now, is there something that we can actually recognize as a pattern that somebody who's being victimized as such? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the social media is, is really challenging because it changes all the time. But I think, you know, in schools, we're trying to educate more and more. We're doing assemblies, things like that, to really educate um, young people, parents, teachers, on the vulnerabilities of the social media and having those checks in place and knowing who they're connecting with. Um, you know, a lot of times when you see a student all of a sudden changing their circle of friends from the kids they grew up with and all of a sudden they have friends that are outside of the school, they are starting to quit their, um, their extracurricular activities, their grades start plummeting, they start missing school. I mean, there's some signs that this kid is heading for trouble that can be investigated and try to catch them, hopefully when they're being groomed instead of full force being um, trafficked. So there's definitely some signs to look for in young people that are vulnerable for being trafficked. 
So if we recognize one of those signs, what is the best thing that we can do to assess? Well, we do a lot of training um, because all different disciplines um, can play a part in recognizing and helping out a potential victim. So, so for example, um, in schools, you know, administrators, nurses, uh, the social services uh, people. There's a lot of times a homeless liaison in, in public schools now. So if they're educated on the signs of trafficking and human trafficking, then they can really intervene in a student's life. Because a student, they're not going to recognize themselves as a trafficking victim. They may know, I got in a bad relationship with this older guy. He's forcing me to do things I'm not really comfortable with. But this is what you do in a relationship or we're trying to save money for A, B, or C, whatever lie he gave her. So it's going to be really blurry for that victim. And so if the, you know, teacher, counselor, nurse, um, social worker understands trafficking, then when that student may give them just a tiny bit of that picture, they can ask more questions to try to unwrap what's really going on with that student. Many times a young person um, will talk about maybe one rape situation but really what's gone on is maybe they have been sold for months but they can't tell that horrible of a story but they can just tell a tiny bit but when you're educated and you try to make it a safe place to say what else is going on what tell me about what's been hard you know who, are you being forced to do something you're not comfortable with you know where did you get that tattoo or who's providing housing for you or that expensive purse or your nails getting done, you know, just start probing and asking those questions to find out, you know, who are you in a relationship with and is this a healthy relationship to be in? When there's a big age differentiation between a young person and an older boyfriend or caregiver kind of thing, um, those are kind of red flags to start investigating. So those are some of the things school officials can do. Um, the ER and medical facilities being educated on human trafficking is a huge area um, that that we're really trying to focus on um, across the nation because 90% of human trafficking victims go through the medical clinics or ERs and they are not getting recognized. Um, they're presenting with different issues and oftentimes STDs and they're just being treated and turned away instead of recognizing for those signs, isolating them from the person who brought them in and trying to give them a safe place to find out what's going on with them. And so that's another place. And other social service providers, um, foster care system, juvenile detention centers, there's a, there's a lot of people in the community that, that can be educated to be the eyes and ears for vulnerable people. So if our, you know, if our audience want to actually get involved with your organization, what could they do? We, um, they can go on our website, which is unboundnow.org. Um, we have a volunteer page to sign up. We have a giving page to sign up because we're completely supported by financial gifts, which is amazing, the support we've been given. Um, but there's, you know, educating yourself on it, number one. There's many good books, and we have recommendations on our website. But learning more about human trafficking so that they're educated um, supporting an organization like ours um, so that you can volunteer. And we use all kinds of different gift sets um, because we have IT people, law enforcement, attorneys, um, teachers, trainers, um, other advocacy people that can help with victims because we'll, you know, go meet them, take them to counseling sessions. I mean, there's lots of ways that um, really anyone can be involved with an organization like ours to help make a real difference and stop this. Okay. And could you give us uh, an example of a, of a success story that you had or the one that sticks out in your head in particular of something that occurred and how your organization was able to help? Oh, sure. We've, we have, you know, quite a few. Um, we had one, um, victim here that was 15. She had been in and out of foster care systems. And she had run away and a older man in his 50s literally drugged her and put her in a back room and sold her repeatedly out of his home. And local, I mean, luckily, um, our law enforcement was able to get her, recover her. Um, our organization jumped in to provide services for her, safe place for her. Our DA's office worked extremely hard to um, 
prosecute her trafficker. Our Crimes Against Children unit were incredibly supportive of her. She was in the juvenile detention center for a while, so the counselors there really supported